Phyllis Tickle has a way of helping us uh, wrestle with the deepest meanings of this parable. Let's hear what else she says. Well, for one thing, if we are honest with our texts, we have to say that the nature of sin and spiritual error is being defined in a very uncomfortable, unconventional, and uncodified way. If we are honest, we would also have to say that it is being defined in much the same way that Jesus was given to defining it during his teaching life. To the ongoing consternation of the religious, we know he ate on the Sabbath from the grain he and his disciples gathered along the roadside as they walked. He refused to stone an adulteress, as the law required, and then made it impossible for others to do so. He talked in depth and publicly to a Samaritan who, even more damning, turned out to be a Samaritan woman. He set a table with flagrant sinners, including whores and Roman toadies. Over and over again, by act as well as word, he pushed against the moralism and the derivative codes of religion, but never more clearly and never more incontrovertibly than here in our two parables. Jesus pushed against, he, he was contrary to what was happening in those moments. I think the Jesus of the Gospels is a very appealing figure, one who is, is greatly hidden, it seems to me, from the, from the average person who professes to follow him. When I was a teenager and young adult, I like to say I knew more than God did, so <laughs> why should I need God? I walked away, and I think part of the reason I walked away was that the Jesus that had been preached to me was a very boring Jesus, a very ordinary, very uninteresting Jesus. Part of my return to the church was, of course, God's pulling on me. I would never have returned without that kind of pulling. But part of the return was understanding that there was a much more radical, mm -hmm. interesting, amazing turning the world upside down, Jesus, that, mm -hmm. that I could begin to love with all my heart. I think we're still afraid of that Jesus. I think the church is. I think I am. I think a lot of people are still afraid of him. Well, I am. <laughs> you know? I am. I, I honest, think you're right. I, I think we are still very much afraid of him. But if Jesus is about creation and new creation, going into where there's chaos and bringing a new order, then why should we be surprised to find Jesus in the places that always surprise us? I think about being on the margins. I live in what some people would call the margins. African-American woman, I have a disability, I'm a lesbian, and you know, I'm a pastor, I'm Christian. And out here, I don't see it as chaos. I see Jesus stepping into my reality and saying, I'm here with you. Maybe I, we can show other people that you are whole right here. Mm. And where they are, they're whole. What looks like chaos to those who really want order right. is really a different order. Exactly. But then Jesus comes even into that, into our realities, and even there wants to turn things upside down. He wants to turn it all around. Right. It's all of it. This is upsetting for me because um, you can't put this, uh, the image of Jesus in a box when you think of compassionate, kindly, loving, grace-filled Jesus Christ, the, the Good Shepherd, the paintings that we have uh, that are so serene and, and uh, uh, safe. And then you get this difficult parable which says um, those who have will have more. It's um, it's upsetting. It's a different voice, a different image, and uh, you just can't control that, and it's troubling to us. But that's the beauty, I believe, about this, all the scriptures, that there are many voices, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore uh, there's place for all of us in the kingdom. What about this take on this idea where he says, he to him who has uh, more will be given, and him who has not, it will be taken from him and given to the one who has. One time I was digging clams with my family. Later, as the evening, as the day grew late, uh, the beach sort of emptied out and there were a few other people there. They weren't digging clams, but a woman came by and gave me a whole other bucket of clams. She didn't give it to anybody else. And all of a sudden this parable came alive for me. Mm -hmm. Because we were there digging clams, she added those clams that she had to us. Mm -hmm. Didn't give them to anybody else. Yeah. I think this parable says something about the importance of our passion at that moment was to dig those clams. Yeah. And you saw value in those clams that those people who were not doing anything about them did not see. Right. So but they so saw that you like clams. Right. <laughs> and and, and it's like those, let those who hear, let them hear. Right. There's going to be uh, people who really respond with energy and passion and commitment. And is Jesus saying here that passion is what I'm about? If you're passionate, I'll give you more passion. If you don't have it, 
that'll even be taken away. I think of it in terms of Jesus saying, when you grow in grace, when you are sanctified, um, that your life will be even more rich and more full and more will be given to you because of your growth in grace. I'd like to be sure we don't confuse this with being saved. Mm. Uh, don't confuse sanctification really. with justification, as we Lutherans like to say. <laughs> but that this is not about who's going to get to the kingdom and who's not going to right. get to the kingdom, but what rich and full lives we'll have because of our growth in grace. Mm. Yeah. Let's, Let's see where Phyllis Tickle takes us now. Let's see how she brings it on home. Or if love be too weak and abused a word nowadays to be applicable here, and I suspect it is, then let us say, as do the parables, that the profitable servants yearned toward the master. They positively glow in the light of him and his approval. They also yearned so completely that they gambled with his goods in pure blind faith that that was really what he meant for them to do. They yearned so completely, in other words, that they believed his intention, his spirit, if you will, as they understood it, and they gambled themselves on fulfilling it. They, in short, loved the master with all their hearts and souls and minds, for this is the first and great commandment, and all others are secondary unto it. What am I willing to risk for? Am I really willing to risk my life for something? Jesus is calling us to something here. Don't just sit on what you got. It's about that yearning, isn't it? About that deep, aching, pining yearning. Uh, yearning to be a servant of the Lord, yearning for those who don't know Jesus, yearning to be able to touch them with the gospel, yearning to give all that it takes from us to do that. The call of all of us while we're all created is to live out that passion. And us as leaders are in the church are called to help people identify what that passion is right. and then cultivate a space where they can live into that. And what could be more attractive to other people around us? Who do we want to hang out with? The person who's hiding the little bit he has or the person who's saying, let's go for it. <laughs> we want to be where passion is. And that's where we'll find Jesus every time. Thank you for your reflections. Thank you, Phyllis Tickle, for your message. And thank you for being with us on day one.